afternoon, everyone. Oh, no, we're not. We're still in the morning. So good morning, everyone. All right. As if time doesn't go fast enough, here I am trying to move it forward. OK. All right, so as Dr. Dodge mentioned earlier, what we decided to do as a consortium is really we wanted to focus on these areas where we had some gaps and areas where we could be improved because I think it's important to share all of this with you because this is what these events are for, so we can learn from each other, so that we can get feedback and grow from these types of experiences. So just a little bit of background information at the University of South Florida. We do have a large population of transfer students for this incoming class. I'm only reporting numbers that are on our fact sheet, so I don't get in trouble uh, anywhere. So um, for this incoming class, we have um, just, I'm going to just give you some percentages. So we have uh, down to the decimal 58.8% in, in the USF Florida system. So we've got St. Pete, Sarasota Manatee, and of course our Tampa campus. So that's, you know, rounded up a little bit. We have 60% of our incoming class transfer students, and that rings true for every one of our campuses. At Tampa, we're at 57.4, at St. Pete, 59.6, and at Sarasota Manatee, 77.3%. So our transfer student population truly is, at any given time on any one of our campuses, the largest population that you shall see. All right, so with that, let's get started. So I am a researcher, of course. I'm an administrator, but I'm um, also a researcher. And I think it's very important to have a conversation with you about what we know. Oftentimes, in the literature, when we have conversations with each other, we talk about how do we improve transfer student success, and we don't truly talk about the institutional partnerships that are key to the, to, to the success of our transfer students. So the literature lets us know that this is what we have to really shift our focus on as we move forward, that it's not enough for us to do operational information and operational tasks and operational initiatives at um, each individual level. We really have to work together as a partnerships, institutional partnerships are key. So I want you to remember that as we go on today. We have to make transfer a priority. Let's just face facts. I, I love to talk about, you know what, you can tell a lot by me if you just look into my bank account. Look at where I spend my money. You can tell where I like to shop, where I like to eat, what I like to do, how much I save, how financially stable I am. So I talk about this because transfer, we don't put our money where our mouth is. So I'm talking about Florida right now. We are focused on metrics. How many metrics do we have on transfer students? Yell them out. Goose egg. <laughs> it's really important for those of us who are here to support our transfer students at every single time that we can that we focus on the fact that, you know what? What matters at the institution is what we measure institutionally. We're all here for the right reasons. We know that. But we have to have a unified voice to talk about the fact that there's no transfer metrics. And we have to change that. So I'm leaning on all of you to help support our effort in that. So next, of course, no surprise to this group, we have to provide tailored transfer advising. Transfer advising looks a little bit different from advising of our FTIC students. No surprise there. And then, of course, what the literature tells us across the board is that we have to create clear programmatic pathways that are aligned with high quality instruction. So our students know what's going to happen from one institution to the next. So we do have transfer priority institutions. Three of them are represented in a consortium, but we also have them across the nation as well. Take a look at some of the great things that Kansas is doing or perhaps even Arizona. But there are several ones that are out there. So it's really important that you look at the significance of the president's position. All of us can remember uh, at, at any given time when we have the information that comes out on those really nice glossy pieces of paper with the university facts or new initiatives, they make a point from the president down, whether he or she is in front of an audience, whether they're speaking to a smaller group of people. Most of us on our campus who are tuned in, we know what's the priority of the president, do we not? The position of the president matters when it comes to supporting our transfer students. We have to look at the role of our senior leadership. Same that goes for our president, also goes for those that are in senior leadership. When they're in meetings, what student populations are they talking about? When we're talking about budgets, what student populations are we talking about? When we talk about strategic planning, when we talk about our mission, are transfer students a part of that? And if you happen to be in those rooms, I encourage you to step out and talk about the importance of our transfer students. The transfer institutions that are doing it really well make these things a priority. 
And of course, uh, no surprise, has to be uh, communicated. It has to be communicated to everyone. I also like, I like to use examples and metaphors because I feel like people remember those. One of the things that I like to talk about, do you all remember when Nike used to have Nike and then the swoosh? What does the swoosh mean? We don't even need the Nike sign anymore. We know the swoosh is associated with Nike. Transfer students have to become so important that we no longer need to talk about transfer student success, that we have a culture that recognizes all we need is a swoosh. When we talk about student success, we don't have to say, well, what about transfer students? When we talk about orientation, well, what about transfer students? When we talk about making different initiatives, generally, we always have to talk about, okay, that's what we're going to do for our freshmen, but what are we going to do for our transfer students? It has to become part of the fabric of our culture and our institutions if we really want to move the dial so we can change those numbers that we saw earlier today that was presented by Ms. Sanchez. Data collection and analysis. We all know it's very important to find out where we stand individually as institutions, but it's also very important that we need to find out about operational data. So we have state data and federal data that we report because we legally have to, but it's important that we have operational data that's real-time data because I need to know today how many of my transfer students are enrolled for the next semester with a full-time course load. Those are the type of things that we need to make sure that we know, and those are the type of things that transfer institutions that make transfer students a priority are doing daily. Another thing, when we have this data, we have to disaggregate the data. We know that students are not the same. We know that just from, we heard from our keynote this morning, depending on uh, race, ethnicity, income level, access, all of these things matter. So if we have data and we don't have it disaggregated, it's not gonna help us. Another thing, how many of us sometimes just feel like we're collecting data just to collect data? We have to move away from that. We have to collect data and use the data to make informed decisions. Because having data just to collect data isn't going to get us anywhere. So these are just some of the things that we want to focus on. All right, so the literature also tells us we have to create very clear pathways. Very simply, that just means when it comes to curriculum, that a student understands what they need to take at their junior or community college, and it's very clear, it's crystal clear, that what they have to take there, and then they're gonna to transfer to the four-year institution that they understand what they're gonna have at that institution. And I mean, down to the exact courses, it's not enough to say, oh, here's a, a block of things that you can take perhaps this semester or that semester. I'm not talking about getting down to when you need to take electives. Of course, we all understand that that's important. But we cannot, we just can't any longer say, well, here's a bunch of classes you can take and this is when you can take it. We need to get serious. We need to get intentional about making sure that we have semester plans, especially for our transfer students. They're here for a purpose, to move from one institution to the next and graduate in a timely manner that they've set for themselves, and we need to make sure that that's clear. Okay, we also want to make sure, um, uh, I'm going to move right on. So we want to make sure we have tailored academic advising. This is very, very important. We all know that academic advising changes retention numbers. We know that academic advising changes the student experience. We know that academic advising truly is the heartbeat of student success. I'm a former advisor, can you tell? <laughs> so we know how important this is, but not only do we know it, but the literature and the research has told us this for some time. The jury is no longer out. We know how important it is. We can remember the time when professional advisors didn't exist and then all of a sudden they seemed like they just exploded on the face of higher education. They make a difference. So the importance is that when they're at the, for our students that we know have a plan to transfer from the community and junior colleges to our four-year institutions, we have to make sure that they know about their major and they know about their major selection early. So that means that not only are we just making sure that they select a major, but they understand what that means. So you, we're starting to hear common themes coming up over and over again. So a student needs to understand what does it mean to select a major, and we need to assist at an institutional level to provide the resources and assessment tools to ensure that that student's aptitude, their, the, where, their disposition, their talents are well suited to that major and it will transfer to them understanding what that means when they graduate, whether that's graduate school or going on to a career. So we can't just stop at making sure that the student understands their major. We have to move beyond that. 
And then when we get over to uh, the four-year side, so we want to make sure that our academic advisors who are at the four-year campuses are actually embedded in the community and junior colleges where the students are going to be transferring to so that they have that nice path so that they understand, oh, this is an advisor that I met with when I was at my community college and this advisor is also here with me when I moved to my four-year institution. That's what's going on as far as the best practice that we have to make sure that we do. We need to make sure that we also have conversations about financial literacy and understanding for a transfer student that looks a little bit differently. Sometimes even at the four-year institution, how we decide to award students um, awards, financial scholarship awards, financial aid, not all institutions do that the same. We have to make sure that our, that our students understand that the awarding of uh, financial aid may look a little bit different. And it's our responsibility to make sure we create buckets of space, whether it's scholarship money, whatever we can to make sure that our transfer students are successful. We have a lot of scholarships that focus on FTICs. We have a lot of scholarships that exclude our transfer students. And the institutions that are doing it well remove those barriers so that they are focused on that as well. So, <clears throat> at the University of South Florida, we have the FUSE program. We work with eight different partners. I, I know some of our partners are here today, I've seen them. So, as we align with what the literature has told us about things that we have to do really, really well to make sure that students are successful, these are some of the key areas. Yes, we do have leadership support. Do we have leadership support in the way that it should be? No, and, and I'm okay with saying that in a public forum. So, the leadership support is there, but not in a manner that matches the FTIC support. That's problematic. We do have partnerships with eight institutions of community and junior colleges, so we've already done what they've told us to do as far as best practices and the literature and what we know helps students be successful because we make sure that our students understand that path before they even get to the University of South Florida. We have advisors that are embedded in the institutions, and then uh, we also have them work at, uh, on our main campus as well. So they, we, we are pretty good in that area. We do a good job in that. We do create clear pathways. What we, we call them graduation pathways. They're known as grad paths, on, to be short. So students know exactly what to take before they get to the University of South Florida, and they're on their grad path before they get to us. We do have um, a, few, a few scholarships, so we are able to uh, plug in the area that most transfer students don't have when it comes to transferring over. We give them incentive and have scholarship funding that's just for them as long as they're part of the program. But to my point uh, of what I wanted to talk to you about, so the areas of opportunity that we have here when we talk about some ident identified gaps and challenges. So at the University of South Florida, and I'm pretty sure just about every institution that's represented here in this room, who gets the majority of the focus at your campus? FTICs, same thing with us. So that really is where we have to change. And that's where I go back to leaning on all of you in this room to go back and tell someone and hope that, hopefully that person goes back and tells someone. The state of Florida has to have a metric for transfer students for us to truly move this dial. Until we get to that point, we're going to continue to have conferences like this. We're going to continue to do well for transfer students, but we're not going to move the dial in the manner in which our universities can move the dial when it comes to changing freshman metrics if we want to actually match them. So that's a true area of opportunity for the University of South Florida, and I'm sure it's a true opportunity for your universities as well. We like the strategic planning behind how do we truly move the dial for our transfer students. What does that look like when they come to our campus? Do we have the infrastructure to ensure that they're successful in the same manner to actually match or exceed what we do for our FTIC students? And the answer simply is no. So I talked to you about the fact that we have embedded advising. Our academic advisors are away from our campus the majority of the week. So they work really well with our students when they're at their junior and community colleges, but they're not on our campuses as much as we'd like them to be now that our few students are actually there. That's an area of opportunity and a gap there. And the only way to really solve that is for us to have additional resources to make sure that there are dedicated academic advisors that are there. So at the University of South Florida in undergraduate studies, we have a, a, a really great model where we have an Office of Academic Advocacy. So we have transfer advocates 
that work with each incoming cohort, but they're very purposeful and intentional to work with what some students, um, what some of us may identify as when we notice that they need additional help. So that's a population of students, but on a large scale, we don't have anything to really address that transition period. That's an uh, area that we really can um, improve. When it comes to the data, of course, we need to acknowledge and promote and collect operational transfer data. Just to go back to my point earlier, we're not doing that to scale the way that we can to really make changes individually for our students so that we can ensure that those numbers on a large scale are changed for our transfer students. And then we all, we, we all here in the state of Florida, so we all know about the two plus two initiative. That's there. So a student doesn't have to go through the FUSE program. They can still participate in the two plus two to transfer. So what we need to do is apply some of the things that we know work really well for our FUSE program to ensure that some of our students can transfer through another means. Because our FUSE program is very clear and you have to have, um, there's a time around it. So you can't just take forever. You can't just finish whenever you want to. By agreeing to participate in a FUSE program, there's a clock that starts ticking. That's not for every student, but there's a lot of good positive aspects of that program that we can adapt to apply to another path, which is the two plus two for students to go to our process. Our application process isn't as seamless as we like it. That's certainly an area of improvement, especially for students that have agreed to be in this program. We shouldn't require that they go through an entirely new application process once we technically have said you've already been admitted to the University of South Florida as long as you stay on this grad path. So that's an area that we need to improve as well. Taking student success to scale, we haven't done it when it comes to transfer students. There are pockets on our university that do excellent work in improving the lives of our transfer students, but it's not to scale for many of the reasons that I discussed today. Uh, and another thing is that we have eight wonderful partners, but that also poses a challenge when you have limited resources, limited space, and limited time. So that is also one of our gaps and challenges as well, to make sure that we're providing the attention that's necessary to ensure that each of the eight institutions meets their individual goals, but we all collectively work together to meet the overall goals of the FUSE program. And then, of course, um, the university data when it comes to the transfer student voice. And I'm very excited that we're going to get to hear from our transfer students this afternoon, uh, or this morning rather, because that's the voice that matters the most, hands down. It doesn't matter what I say, it doesn't matter what any of us say, we really need to, as a university, collectively understand the value of, of the transfer student voice, the value of focus groups, the value of qualitative data. Survey data is very important as well, but there's some things that you can really get when you stop and have some conversations with the right methodology to you so you can add that to your qualitative, um, your quantitative research, so that we can truly hear the perspective of students from a wide range of backgrounds when it comes to our transfer student population. Their voice is not at the forefront as much as I would like it to be. So with the little bit of time that I had here today, Overall, these are some of the areas of, of gaps and challenges, and that I'm hoping that with all of us being here today that the wheels can start to turn, that we can collectively address this as a state, we can collectively address this as a consortium. Thank you.